Hello, and welcome to the Invest with Carl podcast. This podcast will bring you obviously everything about Carl Investments, discussions about new features and strategies being launched, as well as commentary on general alternative investments news, slanting towards quantitative perspectives and the general democratization of sophisticated investments. Or said simply, bringing high quality, sophisticated investments to all investors. We're looking forward to the conversation, so let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the Invest with Carl podcast. I'm Jamie Eppenberg, your host and a member of the Carl team. Today, we're talking to Alan Harmer, the manager of the Carl K2 strategy. Uh, I'm sure some of you remember Alan's uh, bio from his previous podcast, where we talked about the strategy K2 in general. Um, Alan has been in banking and investments for financial services for many, many years, uh, more than we probably want to talk about. He has worked at major institutions all around the world, and he has worked uh, in many cities all over the world, New York, Sydney, Uh, in the Middle East, uh, in London. He has been everywhere. So right now he is in Sydney, Australia, uh, and we welcome him again back to the show to talk a little risk. Hi, Alan. Welcome. Hi. All right. So uh, it is our risk series, and we've talked a lot about how active risk management is a critical function within Carl Strategies, an important part of our due diligence because a strategy's ability to control risk, significantly decrease or even avoid downturns in and of itself will increase gains. I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks and talked to Gennar about it last week. So with that as a backdrop, what does risk manage- management mean within K2? Um, thanks, Jamie. As we talked in the original part of the series, um, Risk management is an intrinsic part of what K2 uh, does in its operation. Um, We control uh, the stocks that we own uh, and move out of them as they become more expensive. Uh, In terms of markets, we tend to move out of them when they become too expensive. So that's that's part of the process. We have a batch of filters that that monitor that on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour basis. Um, the process is not perfect. Uh, there'll be days, even weeks, in, in which we don't get uh, the sorts of returns that we're looking for. Uh, but over a long period of time, and I've been doing this for 20 years with, uh, uh, with this process, it, it seems to be fairly stable. Um, the process is automated uh, and systematic. Uh, the judgmental part of the process is done when we formulate the uh, the criteria and the filters when we set up the uh, the process itself. Which those have been stable for some time, right? You haven't really had to adjust. No, the, a um, while. We, we reserve the right to change things as, as things change. And the last couple of months, year, 10 years have been interesting. Uh, and and so when, one of the important things is to have flexibility. It's... it's um, one of the, the common threads across people who manage money is that they need the flexibility to, to change their positions uh, and change the way they do things uh, as things change. I mean, to do otherwise is, is to be um, stubborn, and we're far from stubborn. Um, but with that in mind, the original principles that we've had, we've followed through all the way through and haven't, haven't felt the need to change those. So we massage at the margin but the core principles should remain the same. Got it. Okay. And I think I've heard you talk about the the risk management is really that um, as stocks move to extremes, you remove them from the eligible universe. I think I've heard you say that a couple of times. Yes, so that's yes, really correct. how it goes. Correct. Yeah. Um, and and we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that, how, how we've been watching K2 lately. Um, but let, let's go a little broader then. How much of a factor have you, like how much when you talk to professional investors, how much of the conversation over the years you've been doing this is about risk management? When you talk to pros who are interested in, you know, strategies that you've managed? Um, a lot is, is the easy answer. Uh, we tend to focus, we generally being the, the institutional investment community tends to focus uh, on the 
um, the downside risk, the, the vulnerability to the big dips. Uh, the last 50 odd years, there's been five major shifts and we, we can tick them off as we go. But in recent times, we only have to go back to March last year when the market dropped 23% in a couple of weeks. Uh, but for those who've been around for a while, you can remember 87, the, the tech uh, bubble of 2000, uh, the global financial crisis of 07, 08. So there's, there's a succession of these big ones. And so those who are managing money are mindful of those big dips. So uh, what's normally the case is that there are some small corrections that are an intrinsic part of the market. They happen every well, every few weeks, really, when the market can change by anything up to 5% or so. The trick is to know when the market's going to fall further and or whether it's just a zone in which a rebound is possible. Now, the last month or so, a rebound has been the, the way things have happened. Uh, we had an extreme of that uh, last night when large cap uh, semiconductor and, and tech stocks moved up sharply by around about 7%, and some major ones like Tesla moved up 20%. But that's after a period of having fallen uh, by over 20% in, in the previous uh, month or so. So it's, um, it's by no means clear that you should be looking to adopt a, uh, a buy and hold strategy, for want, for, for want of a better phrase. Um, it's far better to be focusing on the changes as they evolve. And that tends to be the institutional focus. There's a lot of work being put into what's called value at risk, uh, how vulnerable um, the overall portfolio is to dramatic changes. Uh, we had um, the, the US 10-year bond rate moved up over 1.6% uh, a couple of days ago, and that spooked the market. That was the, the sell-off of last week. 1987, the German Bund, the German 10-year bond rate, rose above 10%, and that caused the market to drop significantly. And I was in the, on, the, on the board of the of Prudential in the Australian market at the time, and the market dropped 53% in 30 seconds. Now, that's, that's a risky market. Um, I've heard you talk about that one before. I mean, that is a crazy... <laughs> I, I, yeah. You know, if you that's told someone, they'd be like, that's impossible. <laughs> But no, no, no. That's that's real. That's that's part of it. So it's fifty three percent in thirty seconds in eighty seven yes, for the yes, Australian I, market. Okay. I was on a on a plane coming from LA to New York uh, a couple of days after that, and uh, with uh, sitting next to um, one of the Fed governors, and he was saying we in the states were within a couple of nanoseconds of going broke of the banking system being unable to honour checks. And if you, your mind can go back to the, the James Bond movie of Goldfinger, the whole plot of that was to destroy the, the US monetary supply. We were very, very close to that happening. So there are, when you talk about risk, you've, you've got in the back of your mind those major events. If you think of the last year, the, the way markets used to manage was in terms of the fundamentals of valuing companies and valuing the market. And that's gone out the windows that the Fed's been pumping in $7 trillion of, um, of liquidity and that's washed through from the fixed interest markets through to the, uh, through to the equity markets and, and sustained most of the rise of the last year. And, and so at some stage, the concern is if that slows down or reverses, then the market can have a catastrophic fall. So it's it's the catastrophic, uh, what used to be called the black swan events, the, the, the factor X, the ones you don't know, are the ones that people are looking to protect against rather than the individual short-term volatility of the market, which is simply providing an opportunity to move in or out of particular sex, sectors or particular stocks. Right, right. We've seen K K2 does perform better in those more the smaller drops, um, at least we've seen. And and then so where have you seen K2's risk management, you know, really pay off? Um, and maybe not not K2, but um, uh, strategies you've managed in the past. 
because uh, K2 is new to Carl. Um, but strategy you've managed in the past, where have you seen a K2 type strategy, risk management strategy really pay off during these events? Yeah, one one was the 53%. I've got to harp on that. The 53% in 30 seconds has got to be major. Um, but equally, uh, back about five years or so, the NASDAQ dropped 40% in two hours and then finished up for the day. Now, those are extreme movements. What's, what's often forgotten is that investment managers like myself tend to only be around for about three years in, in any one job. And so there's, there's no market memory of, of those sorts of events. People don't have a, a sense of what the, what the dramatic changes can be, that we get by on a day-to-day basis and things are mo- mostly all right. We're taught to buy the dips. Any, any uh, fall in a market is an opportunity to get back in. And mostly it is, but sometimes it's not. And it's the sometimes it's not that is the core of risk control. Got it. Obviously, K2, you feel confident in the in the intrinsic risk controls there and have a lot of conversations uh, with institutions who are uh, institutions, professional investors who are entering into similar investments. That's a lot of what you're talking about is, OK, when we have, you know, a deep dive um, and, or, you know, those black swan events, uh, how are they managed? And that is part of, um, K2 strategy, making sure it can tell when to move to cash. Um, it, in that, why don't you and I take, take a moment to talk about just K2 over, uh, the past couple of weeks. I mean, how, how, how do you how do how do we look at it when I know some of us have been watching the strategy? I'm also invested in the strategy, and it's it's one of those where I watch the like there's a day when we're trading because we're not always trading, right? We're in cash um, quite a bit here and there, so we're trading, and we get to watch it come up. And I'm sure everyone's like, okay, you know, is it going to hold? And then you know, sometimes it's going back down. Um, are you watching it like we are, or I mean, this is a quantitative strategy. So how does that work for you? As we were talking before the blog started, once once you're involved in the markets, you're involved. You, you don't walk away and come back and see it at the end of the day and see what's happened. You, you're watching it on an ongoing basis. And the um, the description I've given of the extreme case is, is really an extreme. There's also all the minutiae of the, the changes on a stock sector market basis, hour by hour, minute by minute. Uh, and we're looking at those situations to see when they're consistent. To take it one step back, what, what we do in the process is very similar to what most other people do. We start with the broad universe of stocks that we've defined as the S&P 500. We try to narrow those down to ones that we think are attractive from a longer-term point of view. Uh, let's call that growth. Uh, and then we try to break that up into uh, valuation. Uh, which seems to be in recent times consistent with the contrarian mean revertive approach uh, and momentum, which are those stocks that move up with the overall market, which in recent times seems to be consistent with what's been happening over the last month or so. So we've got a blend of all these different possibilities happening on an ongoing basis, and we're trying to decide um, objectively what fits but equally, while we're monitoring it, we can see the changes. Now, I've, I've tried to spell it out in the material of, uh, that Carl publishes on a weekly basis for what the views are of the week that's gone by and what our expectations are for the coming week. And I can see it's changed from being a two or three line description to a full-blown essay in terms of what we're trying to achieve. But that that's the nature of the market. And... Um, uh, if, if you go back to the last couple of weeks you, and reread some of those articles, you'll see that there are points of decision even during the day that um, manifest the decision-making process that we're talking about, partly influenced by the market, but partly because the reality is with the dramatic changes that we see, will move some stocks from being attractive to overpriced and some that are not. For example, um, as we started this week, I normally look for about 150 stocks out of the 500, and there are only seven. There are only seven that were attractive. And to me, that generally indicates a flat week. Well, 
overall that's true, but on a day by day basis, day by day basis, it's been anything but true. There's been quite a deal of volatility uh, on a market and on a stock basis um, in in that time. Uh, and how we handle that is is to do it preemptively. When one of the the golden rules is that you you sell when you can, not when you have to. Uh, and that, that's what's happened essentially today is that in the rush to buy large cap tech stocks, everything else has been sold. And, and that exacerbates the problem. And in major moves, that's exactly what happens. And, um, again, one of the throwaway lines is small or less liquid stocks make excellent wallpaper because that's what they are. No one wants them and they just have zero value. So we try to avoid that situation. Uh, one of the things that we do preemptively, I used to uh, do some work in um, uh, what's called barter trade between individual countries for major things like uh, commodities and, and so forth. And we'd value the, the worth of individual countries like Russia and Saudi and, and so forth oh, as to whether they were financially solid. Uh, and what you're trying to do there is, is to get some sense of um, whether they can pay their bills. And, right. Uh, in in right. doing that, that's, that's led to the same sort of uh, feeling that we get on the equity market in, in terms of the changes that might take place. Right. And, I mean, with the quant strategy, it's really your – you and I have had this conversation that it's really without emotion. You're really looking at the strategy, looking what the strategy is, you know, telling us to do and staying the course because it's, you, you know, if you know, if every, everyone from the trading pits in Chicago through the institutional desks in Boston and New York to the individual retail investor know that once you start to get emotionally involved, you make mistakes. Uh, you either get the need and need and greed factors come into play. When you're losing your own money, you get scared and you tend not to make the appropriate decisions. Uh, the examples that I gave before are, are real world exercises of extremes, but on a day to day basis, what do you do today? Um, large cap stocks are up, that's great. Uh, tech stocks are up, that's great. But over a period of time, they're not. So you're trying to, to move into those situations that are attractive incrementally, adding a little bit on, on an ongoing basis right. rather than taking big bets that work from time to time but are balanced by serious losses along the way. Tesla's a great example of that. It's a great, been a great stock the last year. You can argue about the fundamentals of it. Uh, but it's it's been one of the great success stories in the market since uh, over the last year. Um, same as Bitcoin. There's no fundamental underpinning to these things, but it's a judgment call that ultimately is decided by investors who, who think it's worth something or not worth something. Bitcoin, unfortunately, is not part of the S&P 500. I, I would have loved to have been in it, but it's not part of the universe of stocks that we cover. But that's, right, right. that's the way it goes. Well, I mean, that's that's... That's what you, I know, and K2 work at is making sure that we grow incrementally while making sure the risk controls are there, right? To yeah. take the edge off of the the bottoms and the and the um, the downs. Uh, so um, obviously, you there's a, a a method to that. It's intrinsic in the strategy, and you feel very confident that you know that it's, it's worked and and will continue to work in the near term um, with minor adjustments. Um, so what's your perspective if someone uh, is investing in traditional stocks and bonds and has the opportunity to move into quantitative hedge funds? Uh, what's your pers perspective about the risks of both? Um, the traditional approach to uh, equities from a retail point of view has been directed into a, a buy and hold strategy. Uh, and that's, that's historically been fine up until about 20 years ago. And the nature of the the whole uh, industry has changed so radically. It, it's 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 really a recipe for suicide to be just buying a stock, holding it for ten years, and hoping that it goes up. Um, the best way to look at it is to get a sense of what the long term returns are, right, which are around about seven percent for the U.S. markets, with a maximum drawdown of about five percent. That's happening every couple of weeks. 
and about 20% that's happening every now and then, say every five to ten years. Yep. Now, what the approach that we've taken at K2 is to improve both parts of that equation, both to improve the returns and to take through a greater understanding of the possibilities of risk to take a greater charge of what the risk might be. In an ideal world and in, in certain types of markets, you can actually describe what the risk is beforehand. You can certainly um, set the portfolio so that it's um, better positioned to take advantage if risk is indeed significant. Right. So the differences are you know, not as big in a bull market, but when you're seeing uh, volatility or a bear market, then the differences in this strategy versus just, um, you know, buy and hold uh, uh, stock uh, investments, it can be quite significant. That's that's correct, yes. So uh, a wonderful talking with you today. Um, always great insight into K2 and investing in general and love uh, some of the history that you always give us about, usually about downturns and, and how how uh, hopefully we can perform better in the future with those. Um, as always, uh, what is your final risk word for our investors? What what I thought I'd do is just, just talk about what else is possible in terms of management, managing risk from both a retail and institutional point of view. Um, the, the first is, is to consider uh, having trailing stops uh, to cover the downside risk. So if a stock falls by X percent, then uh, a put options um, or an underlying um, trade is, is started to be enacted, which, which limits the downside. Now, that's fine for most markets, but um, the 53% one that I talked about before, everything just gapped straight through those that's protection. So there was no protection. Um, the, the second is to take uh, a move to uh, a more market neutral position by taking an offsetting uh, short position, a negative position in the overall market. And, and that's that that's useful as well. There's pros and cons to it. Um, the, the pro is that it, it does stabilise the overall portfolio and, and, and gives a generally um, more level uh, return. Um, the, the con is that uh, it, it does reduce performance um, and that there's a negative correlation to the overall market, but that's, that's kind of the point of it. Um, but the, the cost of doing that, um, particularly in, given the fact that markets generally are moving upwards over, over time, um, it's, it's unlikely to be the most efficient way of uh, investing in a portfolio. Uh, and the, the final one is is what is the optimal diversification of the portfolio? And, and um, in in the past, those the numbers are around about fifty stocks, and I think that's way too many. There's there's been a push in recent years to have that number significant, significantly reduced. And retail investors traditionally hold a much more limited um, number of stocks. I've found over a 20-year period, uh, holding as few as five stocks gives adequate diversification, provided the risk controls are in place. Um, so th those are the possibilities that there in mind. And the, the close, I guess, is that uh, what we began with is that for K2, risk control is intrinsic to the overall investment process. It's, it's what we do. Uh, it's not perfect. Sometimes there'll be negative years, um, sorry, negative weeks, even months. But over a period of time, that's that's proved itself to be a, a very significant way of approaching things. Yes, I think uh, anyone looking at the history of uh, K2 beyond, uh, even when Carl brought up K2, it's uh, at least I, his, history is not a... a indicator of future however if you look at it <laughs> you would be like wow it's it's got it's, something in there that it's doing it's doing all right that's that's what the regulator has us believe and that's what legally we have to sign off on <laughs> but the reality is if we're picking and choosing between managers you want the guy who's delivered in the past 
and should deliver in the future. Well, um, I well, I guess I would say, you know, if the history of none of them isn't it is, you know, a hundred percent indicative of the future, but you have to choose from what you have, that's how we look at it, right? It's, it's like there's well, a whole another can of words, which may be another blog on it. it probably the, the, best, the best guide of the future is the recent past is a standard principle in statistics. So yeah. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. I get the perspective. Um, Alan, thank you so much. Again, lo- love chatting with you. Love having you on the show. Uh, and uh, we will talk with you soon. Investors, uh, thank you so much. We'll chat soon. Thank you, Bye-bye Joe. now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Invest with Carl podcast. The views shared on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Carl. This podcast is intended for informational purposes only and is not intended to constitute and should not be deemed to be an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any security or investment, financial advisory, legal, tax, accounting, or other professional advice. Carl funds are currently available to accredited investors with a minimum investment of $20,000. To learn more about Carl and to download the Carl app, 